Jesus. 
I had enough faith to, to not deny I should do something. I was like, yeah, you're right. I should do something, but what? And so a friend gave me an idea of just looking up somewhere to preach. And so I did that, and they gave me this website called Pure Spaces. That's how we found this church, actually. And I would have just, I don't know where the people are that work here. But, oh, you guys, just take this on behalf of the church. I just really thank y'all for opening up y'all's door for us and allowing us to be here in this whole Christ in Atlanta. Appreciate you. And so, why am I saying tonight, or Timmy kind of spoke on it, right? Just be ready to receive. Just be ready to receive. There's no reason for you to be here sitting down in these seats right now. If you don't expect to get something from God, for him to download something into your spirit, that you're going to take it and run with it. Can you say amen? I'm going to take what I receive and run with it. Can you say that? I'm going to take what I receive and I'm going to run with it. And the Bible says that you will run and not grow weary, right? You will walk and you will never faint, and you're going to mount up with wings as eagles because the path of the righteous is like the shining of the sun until the perfect day, the Bible said. You get brighter and brighter, and our perfect day is the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So until he comes, can you say, I'm going to increase? Can you say it like you mean, I'm going to increase? Say it like you believe it. I'm going to increase and prosper in Jesus' name. I, mean, I can see the smiles on your faces. Don't y'all believe that? Like, why would I come here? The Bible says that we're telling you the good news, the gospel, the, the word of gospel means good news. I'm not standing over here today to tell you some, some defeated, some, some weak, some uh, better days are coming. No, no, no. Yes, the struggle is real. There are things that we have to wrestle with. There are things that come up against us. But in Christ, the struggle is over. The Bible says that those that are born of God, they, they overcome the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So when you have faith, God has given you the victory to be more than a conqueror. When you have faith, God has given you the victory to step over what the enemy planned to stumble you up. When you have faith, God has given you the breakthrough that you are desiring. Can somebody say amen? amen. And so we're going to preach today. We're going to teach today about faith. Is anybody here born of God? Yeah. Hallelujah. I, I thank y'all for that. Y'all are proud to be born of God. Yes, please turn the lights back on. Thank you. And so, the mission of this, the Bible has missions. It's like a, um, it's just like a catchy phrase, really, that kind of explains what you're going to do. And so, Jesus gives a mission statement in the Bible, something short and sweet and concise. He says that I've come to seek and to save the lost. Can y'all say that? Jesus came, Jesus came. To, seek to seek and to save, and to save. the lost. And those of you that were here yesterday, you remember what Timmy preached on John 14 and 12, which says that those of you, this is Jesus speaking, those of you that believe on me, these same works that you see me do, you shall do also. And so what we combined to Jesus' mission statement was we're going to mobilize the saints. Somebody say, that's me. That's me. Y'all know that? Did y'all know that? Yeah. All right. So we're going to mobilize the saints to do what Jesus did, to see and to save the lost. And so we had these two days of revival. This is the last night of revival. We're preaching to you. And then tomorrow morning we have an outreach, the uh, Sleeping Bag Socks and Saints outreach, led by Rotini and his wife, and they need to get stand. Oh, they have, thank God for them. I love it. And so I want y'all to come out to that as well tomorrow morning because this is what we're mobilizing. This is what we're getting you fired up to do. As I continue to speak on this mic, what you're going to realize is something is going to be bubbling up in your spirit. That's the fervency of the fire of God. And that is what's going to empower you. That's what's going to fuel you to say that I need to keep going. I need to keep doing. That my faith needs action. And now I know where to put that action. All right. And so I'm glad that y'all are here tonight. But tonight is not the end of it. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. Hallelujah. And so, I mean, this is just an introduction. Just kind of want to greet you all and let y'all know what we're here for. Because, I mean, it's so easy to despise the dead small beginning. And you know, the Bible says not to do that. Because God rejoices to, to see a work begin. Yeah. And what that means is, well, let me just add this verse to it out of Job. It says that your latter day, somebody say the later day, the later day. will be greater than your past. It's kind of like these young kids right here. I mean, he's small now, she's small now. Those kids will be bigger than me. If they're, the latter days, they're going to be greater. Can you say amen? amen? And so this is a promise of God that not only in stature are you going to be greater, right? But in possessions. Can somebody say amen? In impact, in influence. You don't want to receive that? Do you, do you all hear me? Yeah. All right, because I need y'all to talk back to me because, you know, 
Joanna led praise and worship today. I thank God for you, Joanna. Right? And so even in between her going through the songs, right? She started giving a message, right? Words. She started trying to build your faith. Because if you begin to praise God, you know what? You know what makes it easy to praise God? When you believe what is written of him. When you believe that God is able to do just what he said he would do. Come on, they did a lot. That song did a lot. Right? When you believe that he is the way maker, that he is the miracle worker, the promise keeper, can you say amen? Right? It makes it easy to praise God. Because your praise lets God know that you believe that he is who he says he is. Case in point, if you've ever been to a basketball game, what is a losing team doing? Sulking, right? Nobody's happy on the bench. The coach, the coach is cussing. He's throwing the board at people. And what is the winning team doing? They're rejoicing. And so when you're rejoicing, we magnify the Lord together it's because we know that we have victory. She's saying, I'm going to see a victory. And so if you see that tonight, I'm telling you, you're walking out of here with your victory. Can you say amen? Can you clap your hands on you people? Can you shout to God with a voice of triumph? Come on, those that are born of God who have faith. The devil doesn't want you to open up your mouth. The Bible says to have faith in God. And then the next verse says, if you would, you would do the same thing, you would speak to mountains. The thing about that, Jesus curses the fig tree and it dies. And when he spoke to it in the moment, they saw nothing. His disciples were with him and they saw nothing of it. He said, nobody's going to eat from you. But they came back the next day. You know what they realized? It withered from its roots. So what happened is started in the unseen. So when you're speaking, can you see these words that I'm saying? No, you can't, but in the unseen, right? What's happening in the unseen is bringing power into the natural. As I'm speaking to you, these words that are spirit that you do not see is doing something here, right? Something's bubbling up inside, and that's what our praise does. Our Praise is fighting the battle for us in the spirit, in the supernatural. For we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with powers and principalities and rules that we can't see. But when we praise God, have you ever read in Acts 16 what Paul and Silas did? When they prayed and they sang praises, and then what happened? God stepped on the scene in the prison where they were in, and they had been beaten. The, the, the prison shook, and the chains, they fell off. Come on, take the shackles on my feet so I can dance. The doors, they were open, and the praise and worship of two men brought freedom to an entire prison. Do you see what I'm saying here, right? Do you know what happened when they marched around Jericho seven times and they let out a shout of victory? The priest, the priest, they blew their trumpets and then what happened? Those huge Jericho walls, they fell down and they began to possess the victory that God had given them. Can you say amen? Are you familiar with this? Are you familiar? And so if we don't take the time to praise God for, for, for vain, we don't do that. We're not, this, it wasn't for Joanna that she led us through praise and worship. It was for us to give us an opportunity. Honestly, I, I mean, praise and worship brought me to tears. You heard it? It, it brought me to tears. I mean, it's good to have somebody that seems to be anointing. But I knew that I was joining in with her. She was leading me in praise and worship, and I, I joined in with her. I got into agreement with her. I was singing along with her. And then what happened to Simon is I began to remember what God had been doing for me. Oh, hallelujah. Something happens when you remember what God has done for you. And you know, you know, you're my brother and sister right here. When I met them, I had no idea who they mean was. When T.P. wasn't married, he got all this trouble that he was dealing with. And look how he's rejoicing now. Look how joyful he is now. Because, oh, come on, hallelujah. I thank God for his brother. I see his victory. Hallelujah. <laughs> I see your victory. Come on. When I met Jordan, the same thing. All this struggle that he was going through. The ark wasn't a thing. But he built it. And before it came into the natural, he built it in the unseen. Yeah. There's a rule of the universe that all things are built twice. And what that means is before something happens in the natural, it's first established in the spirit. Can you say amen? And so what happened was Jordan got an idea in the spirit, in the unseen. God gave him vision, plans, purposes, pursuits. And he wrote the vision down. He made it plain. And he took it and he ran with it. And then it came into manifestation because he believed God. And so what happened in the unseen was established in the scene. Because somebody got into agreement with what God said. I've seen him come out of poverty. Yeah. I've seen him come out of distress. Yeah. There were times when he had nothing, but 
God still puts something in his hand because the Bible says God gives seed to the sower. When you are a sower, right? When you are a giver, God will put seed into your hand. In order for him to give, to give you seed, you have to first be a sower. And Jordan said, here are my Lord, send me. Here are my Lord, send me. And this brother took a chance on somebody he'd never seen preach before. He just knew I had to call. I mean, everybody at my church kind of knew. They knew they, nobody knew who I was. I came to the, the church I go to now in January. It's out of nowhere. But I hit the ground running because I had a heart for God. Yeah. And this church was full of people with a heart for God. This church was full of things you could do. And I just tapped in. I just plugged in. And from that, they, served, they saw the desire. They saw my passion for the Lord. And they said, we can use you. And Jordan was one of those people. And not only himself said, I can use you, but God told him to reach out to me. And I mean, I'm here today. This is happening right now. You can see here right now because God spoke to me through Jordan. And something that was built in the unseen. You are here. You're the manifestation of Christ in Atlanta. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so I got a really good thing God for you. And um, I'm going to do some more talking about you. The Bible says in Matthew 4, in Matthew 4, 23 through 25, we're not going to read it, but these verses deal with Jesus went about teaching, preaching, healing, and then what happened was it spread his fame, and then it increased his following. Somebody say he taught. He preached, and he healed, and it brought him fame. You don't have to repeat that part. It brought him fame to do those things, and then it expanded, it increased his following. And so what we have been commissioned to do here, we are teaching you, we are preaching to you, and God is going to manifest, he's going to manifest healings, right? And it's going to increase the fame of Jesus, and it's going to increase his following, and that is what our mission is to do tonight. We are mobilizing the saints to save, seek and save the lost, right? And in order to do that, what we're doing is we are teaching, preaching, and healing. So I say, man, the babies are fine. The babies are fine. It doesn't matter. I got a mic. I promise you, they can't cry louder than me. I'm not even speaking as loud as I can. Hallelujah. You thank God for them. It's good to talk even even brought them. I mean, babies should be able to sit in meetings like this. I mean, they don't have understanding right now, but there's an anointing. There's a Holy Spirit. He's not, he doesn't care what your age is. He doesn't care what your, what, I'm not going to say it's not, He doesn't care if you're a male or a female. He doesn't care how tall you are. He doesn't care how old you are. He's still touch you where you are. He said, do not forbid the children from coming unto me. Yeah. You know, God puts the children <laughs> as the key marker, the key marker for the type of faith we're supposed to have. Yeah. Hallelujah. So the babies are fine. I see, as I start talking about it, y'all calm them down. Hallelujah. <laughs> good. And so I'm going to get to this in a second. I just want to set everything up. The Bible says in Romans 12 and 2, to be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I'm going to do a lot of teaching today. And so this, this mind renewal, right, this is what repentance is all about. A lot of us say, oh, I repent for this, I repent for that, but repentance is not, it's not in speaking. Repentance is in acting. So repentance is walking the walk. You're confessing your sin. That's you talking the talk. The Bible says to confess your sins, but with repentance, you change your actions. And how do you change your actions? Because the word repent literally means to change your mind. So he says to be transformed by the renewal of your mind. You have to allow your mind to be changed. Because what happens is, if I close this book, this is an action. And this action began by a thought. So if I'm going to change the way I'm thinking, what am I doing next? Then I'm going to change the way that I'm acting, all right? So if I allow myself to repent, if I allow my mind to be renewed, what's going to follow suit is that my acting is going to change. That I say, I'm going to be more obedient. I'm going to be obedient to what God wants me to do, all right? I'm not going to just follow suit with what my flesh wants, amen? And the Bible says that when we do this, then we'll be able to prove that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And if you remember, like, yo, know, all of us are in America, you go to like grade school literature class and you learn some stuff about like language and dictation and whatnot. When you make a list of things, right, when you're finishing that idea, the last thing you want to list, you put and before it. So, like, case in point, this church has black chairs, lights, a mic, and a preacher stand. So, I finished that thought with 
and a preacher said. And so when we're reading Romans 12 and 2, I won't lose you. It says that God has a good will and an acceptable will. The end there, it finishes a thought. So there's a good one and acceptable. The end separates it. And then it says, and there's a perfect will of God. And so God has three wills that we need to be able to prove. We need to prove what God says is good. We need to prove what God says is acceptable. We need to prove what God says is perfect in his will. And how many of you know that this is his will right here? This is the Bible right here. Yeah. That God's word, this is his word, right? Is also his will. Yeah. And so if I'm going to prove that will, how do I do that? The Bible says that the kingdom of God is not only in word. A little ironic, right? He, he gives us his word. And he says this right here is not where his kingdom is, though. His kingdom is in the power of this word. So if I'm going to prove the will of God, that means I need to prove the word of God, which means that I need to have power. Lo and behold, Jesus says, and you will receive power that which the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Yes. And so I'm believing tonight the Holy Ghost is going to envelop you. He's, he's going to endow you. And you're going to walk out of here with power. Even now, I'm believing that you're going to be receiving power in Jesus' name by the day. If anybody wants to receive that, go ahead and rejoice. Remember, we need to rejoice and let God know that we believe this word. Hallelujah. Yes. Let's have faith tonight. Yeah. And so we're going to be able to to, to Prove God's perfect will. Can you say amen? And in order to do this, we need to have our mind renewed. Amen? So how did this, so this renewal happen is the next point of action, right? It happens by the word of God. We need faith. And lo and behold, faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Can I say that louder, y'all? Hallelujah. And so as we are hearing the word of God today, Faith is going to rise up in us and it's going to wash our minds. We're going to receive the direction from the Lord. We're going to receive his instructions. And it's your job to allow your mind to be renewed. Yeah. And the next thing you will find out is now your acting is different. And how many of you know that the... Actually, you don't. I'll tell you. I got a habit of saying that. How many of you know it's a rhetorical question? But I'm just going to tell you. The Bible, I like these are the three keys of the Bible. Prophecy. Principles and promises. Those are the three pieces of the Bible. So when you're reading the Bible, the Bible is full of prophecy, principles, and promises. And so a case of point of that is even tithing. The first instance that we see of tithing is in the first book of the Bible, chapter 14. Abraham tithes. He gives a tenth. That's what the word tithe means, a tenth. He gives a tenth to a priest of God. And so what that did was it was prophetic. Because it established the principle of giving 10% to God, and then that principle which we follow suit with it, it gives us access to a promise. And in Malachi 3, the Bible says when we tithe unto the Lord, we give unto the Lord, he blesses us. He says, I see if I will pour out the windows of heaven and give you a blessing that is too big for you to even take yeah. in. He says, see if I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. And you know, the Bible says that those that believe God, they took their names and written their names out of the book. And then it counted to them. And the Bible says that there's going to be a time where there's going to be a discernible, a seeable, a tangible difference between those that serve God and those that serve Him not. And so I'm telling you, tonight, this begins the night when people are going to start seeing a difference in your life because you have begun to start serving the Lord as your mind begins to be renewed and your thinking changes and you act in the will of God. You begin to start doing things that servants of the Lord do. People are going to be able to discern a change in your life. They'll be able to serve, to discern this difference in your life. And if you believe that, can you shout hallelujah? hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And so let us be in agreement. The Bible says in Mark 16 and 20, we're throwing it into God's court now. It says that they went and preached everywhere. The Lord worked with them, confirming what they spoke with signs following. And so I'm believing tonight that God is going to confirm these things that I'm saying to you. These are not just affirmations, all right? But I'm telling you to get into a group. I'm saying to shout hallelujah. I need you to do that so that you can show God that you believe. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Ironically. The Bible says that because first you have to believe that God is. You have to have faith that God exists. And the interesting thing about that is we've identified God's existence by what he does. We call him Jehovah Jireh. That means the God who sees and you provide. So because somebody, Abraham, he, he perceived what the Lord has done. And he gave God a name based on the action that he perceived God do. 
God says that I am Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals you and keeps you whole, because there is a pool called uh, Mara, and that means bitter, and they came to it in the wilderness when they had got led out of Egypt by Moses, and they wanted to drink because they were, they were tired, they were weary, and so they wanted to drink at this pool, but it was bitter. And so they threw a stick into this pool, and the stick miraculously cleansed this pool, and they began to drink of this pure water. Now that stick was symbolic of Jesus, but during this time they get a revelation. This is Jehovah Rapha. Yeah. And so we name God Jehovah Rapha because we know what he does. He heals us and he makes us whole. Can you say amen? Yeah. And the interesting thing about that, how this verse I'm quoting finishes, it says that we have to believe that God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. That's very interesting. And so we put all that together. Let's read it backwards. God rewards those that diligently seek him and also believe that he is. And so it's not just to praise God because he exists, no? Because if we identify God's existence by what he does, right? God's a rewarder. And so if we're praising God, we must be praising him because he's a rewarder, yeah. right? If we're, if we're proving this, right? We must be praising God because he's a healer. We must be praising God that he's a provider. We must be praising God because he's fighting our battles for us. And honestly, if I'm, I'm, this is not to condemn anybody, but if I'm sitting in a service and I can see that people are praising God, I mean, I can tell you because they don't know that he is who he says he is. I can tell that they have not been able to identify themselves with Jehovah Rapha. They have not been able to identify themselves with Jehovah Jireh. And what religion tells you to do is to be comfortable with that. It tells you to just praise God because he's there. No, but if we're going to praise the Lord, we're praising him because he's done something. Yeah. There was a, hold on, you know, let me read Acts. Let me read Acts 8. If you have your Bible, turn me to Acts chapter 8. Please and thank you. It's in the New Testament. It's the fifth book, right after John, right before Romans. And so what happens in this book is they get scattered. The New Testament church has begun. Jesus has gone up into heaven. He gives them power. And so there is a disciple in this book, and he goes to a specific place, and we'll read about it. And it says, and Saul was consenting unto the death of Peter. And at that time, Earl, let me just read it as it is. I'll read it on the case you And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And there were, they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, Samaria except the apostles, the twelve disciples that were Jesus' favorites, all right? And so it says, And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great limitations over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and halting men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, that when they were scattered abroad, they went everywhere preaching the word. Look at that. In the midst of intense persecution, the first martyr, this man full of the Holy Ghost named Stephen, was killed. And so this man named Saul continues to persecute the church. And it says here, right, in verse 4, but they continue to preach. Even though the governments were not happy with what they were doing, even though the king was not permitting them to do what they did, right, they still continued to preach. And one thing that we have about this Bible, right, is that, honestly, I think more than half of the New Testament was written from prison. We read about in the book of Acts how the apostles were arrested, right? How the government systems that they were operating under did not permit them to do what they wanted to do for the Lord. But they did not listen to the government because they knew that the word of their God is the ultimate authority concerning them. So when Jesus rose from the, from the grave and he said, I have all power given to me. And I said, now you need to go. You need to preach my gospel. There is no other authority that can stop you from doing what God has commanded you to do. Because what God commands, he empowers. So if he tells you to go and preach, if he tells you to go and to build the ark, if he tells you to go and do an outreach, you need to get up and go. Because God has given you vision, and whatever he has given you the vision to do, whatever he's given you the command to do, he's empowering you to go and get it done. So that grace, that empowerment to get what you are supposed to get done for the Lord, that's coming on you tonight. And so the disciples began to continue to preach. And it says, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and, oh, and he preached Christ unto them. And then it says in verse 6, and the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Look at that. So after he preached, they saw miracles. The Lord worked with them with signs following. For unclean spirits crying with loud voices came out of, look at that. Unclean spirits came out crying with loud voices. 
So when you go into a, and or you see on the internet that somebody's getting delivered, and there's all this shouting and screaming, and then you read the comments like, oh, that is not of God, yada, yada, yada. Tell me you must not have never read Acts chapter 8, verse 7, that for us, the spirits came out crying with loud voices, hallelujah, because the power of God was present. And it says, and many taken with palsies, and they were lame, were healed. Hallelujah. Help. <laughs> I need y'all to read. Read verse 8 with me. This is, this is what I want to get to right here. Say, and there was great joy in Atlanta. Hallelujah. <laughs> and there was great joy in Atlanta because somebody decided that they were going to get up and preach and then God worked with them, proving the word of God that he spoke, the preaching of Christ that he spoke with signs following so rejoicing comes when God does, hallelujah. And so no, nobody's rejoicing at first because they don't know what God does. But tonight you are going to believe that God is who he says he is, that he's not a man that he should ever lie, that he doesn't have to change his mind concerning you because his word is the ultimate authority over your life. Can you say hallelujah? And he's going to work with your faith. He's going to reward you. He's going to reward each and every single last one of you. You're not, you're not here. For no reason. Come on now. So I need y'all to rejoice, rejoice. Hallelujah. And so let's be in agreement. God's going to show up. He's already here. That we've gone into his presence. And all this depression, these depression situations that we have to go through, God's taking that depression from you and he's giving you his joy. That he, he, he's going to stretch you, right? He's going to stretch you as he's also stretching out his mighty right hand. And he's going to touch you and he's going to fill you. And he's going to deliver you. He's going to heal you. He's going to provide for you. Oh, he's going to turn your situation around. Hallelujah. He's going to heal. Somebody say that. He's turning my situation around. The Bible calls him Bell Perry's of the Lord of the Breakthrough. And so that impossible situation. Don't you know where it is written that with God, nothing is impossible? Spirits. 
Like how, how more obvious can you get? There's nothing fruitful that comes from alcohol. The Bible lets you know that let a man drink alcohol so he can forget his trouble. But you know, the Bible says don't be drunk. <laughs> don't be drunk with the alcohol. Don't be drunk with the wine. Don't be drunk with the liquor, but be drunk because you are filled with the Holy Ghost. And yeah. Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit dropped and he fell on the people and they all started speaking in tongues, the people that saw it that were not with they said, oh, these men must be drunk. But Peter said, no, it's too early for somebody to be drinking. These men are not drunk as you suppose. Yes, they are drunk, but they're not drunk as you suppose. They're drunk with the Holy Spirit because he has come upon them and he gave them power. And that power became manifest in the evidence of speaking in tongues. Hallelujah. Let me get back to Colossians 1, 5 and 6. It says, you have had this expectation ever since you first heard the truth of the good news. Look at that. You know why we ask you, is anybody expecting it or not? Because the truth of the good news is going to set an expectation in you. So if you knew that you were going to come here today, tonight, you're going to sit down and you're going to receive the good news. You should have came with an expectation, amen? Because the Bible says in verse 6, this same good news, somebody say the gospel, that came to you is now going out all over the world, hallelujah. It is bringing, it is bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives. Wow. Woo. Wow. So one thing about the good news that we just saw right here in the beginning of verse 6 is that this is the uh, NLT version. It says that it changes lives. So if this good news that you're hearing is not changing your life, then is it good news? But there's another stipulation here we keep reading. The Bible says that it's changing lives of other people just as it changed your lives. Somebody say the good news is changing my life. For the better. From the day you first heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. So here's the caveat. The good news changes your life. It makes you fruitful when you hear it and understand it. Hallelujah. So what's your task in this? Your task is to hear what you're doing I'm preaching to you. But now you need to understand. Knowledge is knowing what? Wisdom is knowing how. And understanding is knowing why. Turn to Luke chapter 8, please, and thank you. There's a story of a centurion. This is a Roman guy. If you don't know, the New Testament was written in a time where God's people, the Jews, the Israelites, they were being occupied by the Greek government, the Romans. And so that's why they had to pay, you know, tribute to Caesar, and that's why they had all these Roman citizens walking around all this other stuff. All right? And so what happens here in Luke chapter 8, is it Luke chapter 8? Oh, Joanna, your name's in the Bible. You see that? Verse 3. It says, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa. Hallelujah. And so, um, this is not the story of the centurion. I sort of wrote it down, but I'll just tell it to you. I'm sure I'm actually pretty close to it, but whatever. I'm being taken away in the spirit to tell you this. Thing. So remember when I said that knowledge is knowing what, wisdom is knowing how, and understanding is knowing why. And I'm bringing up this thing about understanding because the Bible says once you understand the good news of God, right, it begins to change your life. Matthew 8, hallelujah. So if you turn me to Matthew 8, can we thank God for routinely telling me where it is? Hallelujah. My brother in Christ, bearing my burdens, fulfilling the law of the Lord. Let's look at this together. And so we're going to see how faith works. We're going to see knowledge, wisdom, and understanding all through this story that happened with the centurion. And so it says, let me just start from the beginning. He said, there's a mission. It says, and when Jesus went, or when Jesus, 
And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lies at home sick of palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should. <laughs> he says, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. Man, I, mean, I know what I want to tell you. I'm just thinking about it. It's, it's taking me aback. And so what happened here? The knowledge was, actually the situation was, that he had a servant that was sick. And so the centurion shows his knowledge here. This is faith in action. It's that he knew what he needed to do. I need to go get Jesus. He knew how to do it as well. He sent unto Jesus. Come on, like that's very simple. You see that? It's not complicated. I need to go get Jesus. I'm going to go and just sit for him. Look at that. That's knowledge and wisdom right there. But here's the why. This is his understanding of why I need Jesus. It says, for I am a man. Let me read verse 8. It says, just speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. Because here's what his understanding about Jesus Christ. Verse 5. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. Because he understood one thing about Jesus is that when he speaks, it has to happen. When God speaks, it has to happen. So I said, when God speaks, it has to happen. And so he understood this. And so a lot of us don't understand this, actually. So the gospel is not changing our life because we don't understand that when God speaks, it has to happen. It has to come to pass. God's word is the final word. He's the beginning and the end. Get off of the Omega. And so what he says about you, you need to understand that that is the final word about me. The one thing about faith is that I need to have faith to please the Lord. I need to have faith for God to fulfill his portion, his part. Because faith pleases the Lord. And when I begin to please God, he's going to begin to please me. Have you ever heard where it's written, you reap what you sow? So no wonder when I give God what he wants, he gives me what I want. So when I give God all of me, what does he do? Say that one. Why? Because I reap what I sow. Yeah. And so when I'm giving God the pleasure right of Him, if I'm praising His holy name, I'm pleasing the Lord, I'm walking in obedience to Him, right? I'm, I'm, I'm uplifting the name of Jesus. What is He going to do in return? He's going to do what is pleasing unto me. Yeah. God's going to do what's pleasing unto you. Why? Because in His right hand is pleasure forevermore. He wants to open up His right hand over you. Does anybody want to receive God's pleasure? His pleasure forevermore? Where you're no longer having to go through ups and downs Days and that day, Saturday. No, that's not what the Bible says about you. It says you're supposed to continue to go up and up and up, and God is going to give you pleasure and pleasure and pleasure and pleasure forevermore. You say amen. But you have to understand this. A lot of our lives aren't changing because we simply don't understand. People will tell you, you'll hear, but you have to also understand. You need to know why. So when I'm reading the word of the word of God, right? I need to understand that, wow, this has to happen. This is my portion. This is what my situation should be. So it doesn't matter what it looks like, because if God said it, it has to come to pass. About you. When you belong to him, your father, the same God that created. Woo. I ask you, have you ever considered what the God that created this universe in six days can do for you in one night? Have you ever considered what the God that created this universe in six days can do for you for even just one moment? What did he do for you? He created all things. And you give him this moment of time right now. And you, are you not expecting? He made this entire planet in six days, and you're giving him this night? There's no way for you to walk out of here the same you came in. Hallelujah. I'm giving you all this, this understanding, too. There's no way for you to walk out of here with your life and not change. Hallelujah. And so I'm just going to skip into the actual message. This is all just the introduction. Turn with me to 2 Peter, chapter 1. I'm, I'm going to set it all up now. I'm actually going to put the pain in the setup now. 2 Peter, chapter 1. Yes? You know about it. It's kind of hidden. Can you say it then when you get there? A lot of people aren't there yet, probably, because I'm not there yet. 
It's really hidden. No matter what book is it by. Um, Hebrews. So Hebrews is important. After his names. Like the other one. I got it. I got it. Thank you so much. Second Peter chapter one. All right. And so we're going to look at verse one. It says, Simon Peter, servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. It says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through what? Amen. Through what? Amen. All right. Of God and of Jesus our Lord. So let's, if you're taking notes, or if you're taking mental notes, it says that grace and peace are multiplied unto you through what? So if I get knowledge of the Lord, what's supposed to happen? Amen. And so do we understand that now? That as I'm learning the, the word of God, it's going to increase my power and my peace. So a lot of us are going to sleep crying because we don't have peace. And I tell you, you don't have peace because you don't have knowledge of God. I tell you, a lot of you are seeking to do these things that you want to do for the Lord, but nothing is working out because you don't have grace to get it done. And you don't have grace because you don't have knowledge of God. And so I'm reading the word to you so that you can get this knowledge, right? And we have to understand that if God said it, then he meant it. And if he meant it, then surely it shall come to pass. And so if God said, what you learn of me, I will give you grace and I will give you peace. So I said, I'm receiving grace and peace right now. And not only that, in verse 3 it says, According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and God, it is through what? Come on now. You see how important reading the word is? You see how important actually knowing where the, the centurion story in Luke is? Oh, yeah. Is Luke 7? Yeah. Right, it's better than Luke 7, but we'll get off of that. Alright, and so it says, Knowledge multiplies into your life, grace and peace. And it also adds into your life more life. Sorry, Drake didn't come up with that. He didn't come up with more life. Oh, yeah. Knowledge of God. The Bible says more life is added to you when you know God and godliness. Godliness is God's character. It's literally God like this. Let's keep reading though. And so it says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Woo. Yeah. By the knowledge of God, we've been given exceeding great and precious promises. That's his word. I'm just, I'm just saying what he's already spoken, all right? And it says that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, all right, beside knowledge, it says this. Giving all diligence, add to your faith, all right? Add to your faith virtue. And so this virtue is the same virtue that came out of Jesus when the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years touched him. It said virtue came out of him. Virtue is power, but it's positive power. I don't want to say positive energy. I don't want to sound new age, but that's that's literally what it is. Because there's negative power. Like if I went and punch somebody in the face, that's not virtue. All right? But it says to add to your faith, virtue. And it says until virtue add. Are y'all reading with me? Verse 5. And to virtue add. There we go. So we see knowledge again. And then it says. And to knowledge add temperance. This word temperance means self-control. And to self-control add patience. To patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall never be barren nor unfruitful in the what? In the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so if I want to have knowledge of my Lord Jesus Christ, what do I need? I need faith. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. But how does faith go? Oh, by hearing. And by hearing the word of God. So as I'm hearing the word of God, as I'm reading the word of God, faith is coming into me and that faith is giving me knowledge. And what does knowledge multiply to your life? It multiplies grace and peace. What does knowledge add to your life? It adds God's character and more life. Which is very, this is very appropriate. Why? Because Jesus says that the enemy comes into what? Come on, John 10, 10, the enemy comes to do what? But me, I've come to give you what? Life and life more abundantly. But when you don't understand that, you're not living with life and life more abundantly. But I've come to tell you today that this is God's word. This is God's intent for you. That he created you with purpose for a purpose. That he created you to not live this life that you have just below standard. No, God 
God's standard for you is all the way up here. He said, I didn't give you just a life to live. He said, I give you a life to live in in abundance. So I don't understand what we're trying to preach to people to be happy with little. But God says that if you meditate on my word day and night, if you speak about it constantly and you observe all of it, you will make your way prosperous and have good success. So there's no way to be a Christian following the word of God. There's no way to have knowledge of this Bible. There's no way to be obedient to the Lord, to walk in faith and not have Precious, exceeding, great promises. But those precious, exceeding, great promises, I'm telling you, they're coming onto you even now. If you believe that, just clap your hands, rejoice, shout out to God. Somebody say hallelujah. Somebody say amen. And so we have to have faith. Because faith is the knowledge that we need about our Lord and Savior that's going to add unto our lives these precious promises. Amen. And so the actual message of tonight is this thing that I like to call the divine exchange. And I want, to, I want you all to know this. But Paul says, I would not have you to be ignorant. And so if I wanted to preach you know, my first unhindered message, I definitely want to preach this divine exchange. Remember how I was telling you all that everything that is in the natural is in the natural because it's already been established in the spirit. So everything that we see exists because it already has been established in the unseen. From this water bottle, it all started with somebody getting an idea. Yeah. You can't see the idea, but you know that they had an idea because here we have this water bottle. Yeah. All right? Yeah. And so there's always something taking place because it's always that deep. Yeah. There's no yeah. middle ground to these things. You know what I'm saying? Jesus says that if you be lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth because there's no middle ground. Yeah. The lukewarm are the same as those that act like there's just nothing, right? Because There's a um, just another natural law. Have you ever heard that nature hates a vacuum? Right? And so what that means is nature hates a void. Check this out. You see this water in this bottle? Watch what happens to it when I start to drink it. You see those bubbles, right? You know why it bubbles up like that? Because this bottle is filled with water, but as I'm drinking the water, right, I'm taking the water out of the bottle, it's replacing the water with air. Because nature hates a vacuum. Something has to take up this space. Now, I mean, honestly, air takes up most of the space. But here's what I brought that out to say. If everything in the natural, this natural law that nature hates a vacuum, exists in the natural, don't you think it exists in the spirit? So here's what I'm getting to. All right, stay with me. The Bible says in Psalm 50, that we're born in sin and shaped in iniquity. A lot of people are like, oh, no, I'm not really religious. I don't do all that God stuff. I'm a good person. But you're born in sin and shaped in iniquity. So you know what that means? By default, right? Because nature hates a vacuum, so the spirit hates a vacuum. There has to be something there. If you're not blessed, you're cursed. If you're not made the righteousness of God, you're a sinner. All right? If you're not alive, you're dead. And by default, we're born with death. By default, we're born cursed. By default, we're born sinners. And so it's really the trickery of the devil to get people to believe that there's some middle ground that they can step in. No, because do you really think that the God of this world system, Satan himself, is not going to occupy him? The Bible says that there is a great and effectual door of opportunity set before me, but many adversaries. And not only does the devil not want you to take these opportunities that God has given you, but if he prevents you from taking the opportunity, you think he's just going to just let that door just remain open? No, he's going to walk through it himself. He's going to close it behind him. So if we don't occupy as God's telling us to occupy, right? If I don't get up with the vision that God's given me and I don't do what God's telling me to do, lo and behold, the devil starts to set up shop. So if we don't raise our kids at home, lo and behold, the devil will teach them through YouTube. He'll teach them through Coco Melon. He'll teach them through the, the, the perversions of the Alright? 
And so the first verse is 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. It says that, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that, you, that though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. All right? So there's a divine exchange there that he took our lack and he exchanged it for his abundance. Somebody say amen. amen. 2 Corinthians 5 and 21 says that, For God made Jesus to be sin, him who knew no sin. So he never sinned himself. God, God changed his identity. He made Jesus Christ sin. You can look at the word structure there. The word sin is a noun. Nouns identify people, places, and things. So Jesus was made sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. You know the word righteousness there is also a noun? And so what he's done is he's exchanged our identity as a sinner, and he's replaced it with the identity of God's righteousness. Hallelujah. And this, I, oh, I'm skipping ahead. All right. <laughs> this identity issue. Oh, I can't even skip ahead. The last one, my favorite one. Galatians 3, 13 through 14. It says, Christ... Christ has redeemed you from every curse of the law, being made a curse because the Bible says that cursed is everybody that hangs on a tree. How many know he hung on a cross? That was a representation that he had been cursed. But he became a curse. He hung on the tree so that you might, be, might have the blessings of Abraham, all right? And the spirit of God through faith in him. So Jesus became a curse, all right? His identity was not just changed to sin, so yours can be changed to righteousness. His identity was changed to a curse, so that yours can be changed to a blessing. Yeah. All right? Yeah. The Bible says in uh, Genesis 12, we can read the first uh, blessing of Abraham right there. It says, Abraham, I'm going to make you a blessing. All right? The word blessing there is a noun. Whoa, 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 right? Oh, wow. Yeah. Right? It's a noun. Wow. So he changed Abraham's identity to a blessing. Wow. All right? He changed your identity to a blessing, all right? Can you say amen? Yeah. And you know, a funny thing about a noun is when you put it into action, right? What happens when you put a blessing into action? It blesses. So everything you do, everything that you put your hands to, right? It not only will it be blessed, but you will also bless other people. Can you say amen? Everything that I'm going to do, it will bless others. Why? Because God made me a blessing. And when you put a blessing into action, it can't help but to bless other people. Hallelujah. And this is your identity. You know, funny thing about identity, right? Let's just say, for instance, my name is Blue. What's co what color is this suit? What's my name? Let's try this again. Let's try this again. Let's say my name was Blue. What color is this suit? What's my name? So look, did my appearance change anything about my identity? Uh, did my appearance change anything about my identity? And so I'm telling you, it doesn't matter what your situation looks like because your identity is a blessing in Christ. It doesn't no matter what you're going through because if you identify with this word, this word has the final say concerning you. It doesn't matter what the devil's doing. It doesn't matter what the devil's using. It does not matter because if God said it, he meant it. Can you say that? And so don't get, don't get all caught up into this appearance though. Things appear the way that they are because people lack knowledge. Right? Because the knowledge being added to our faith with understanding does what? It changes our lives. And so if I give you knowledge of your identity, right? I, things are going to begin to change. The situation might look <laughs> insurmountable, right? But God says all things are possible. So if you find... Thank you, Holy Spirit. You got to find your whole identity in this whole Bible, all right? With the woman with the issue of blood, she received her miracle by faith. And Jesus says, it is your faith that made you whole. All right? He says, it's her what? That made her what? All right, so if you want to be made whole, you need to have your whole identity, your whole faith put into what God says. Is anybody believing to be whole tonight, all right? And you need to put your whole identity in this gospel, in this good news. You need to understand what God has said about you. You need to understand what his burden is concerning you so that you can see the change in your life for the better. Because this gospel, this good news, is not bad news. God has nothing bad concerning you. There is no wrath that is supposed to come your way. There's no curse that's supposed to come your way. There is no 
done righteousness that's supposed to come your way. Why? Because when you're born of God, it says you don't sin and the devil cannot touch you. But the devil is a lawless one. We call him the lawless one because he doesn't obey the law. Yeah. What happens when he doesn't obey the law? It's the same thing that happens to you when you don't obey the law. Somebody puts you in check. You know he can rebuke the devil? Yeah. A lot of people don't understand that. You know what happens when your kids start acting up? What do you do? Put them in check. Yeah. You remind them, no, I have the authority here. Yeah. All right? And you know what's interesting about authority these days is our authority is delegated by him who has all power. You know, he says, I have all power in my head, now you go. That's our delegation, right? That's our empowerment, right? To go and do what he said that we're supposed to do. So when he says that you're supposed to step on stakes and scorpions, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to step on stakes and scorpions. When he says that you're supposed to go to the other side, what are you supposed to do? You're going to the other side. It doesn't matter what the situation looks like. It doesn't matter what storm is in between you and where God has told you to be. You are getting there in Jesus' name. So I just want to it's okay to clap in church. It's okay to shout. Lord, let me shout by myself up in here. This divine exchange changes your identity. What's interesting about this church in Galatia, I'm just going to summarize chapter 3, is that they came to a lack of understanding. You know, many of the churches that Paul wrote, wrote to in the New Testament were not Jewish churches. He's speaking to Gentiles, people like you and I. People who were not born a part of the nation of Israel. But you know, the Bible says that when you put your faith in God, those people that have faith in his word are the sons of Abraham. You know what the Bible says in John 1, 12? That Jesus gives power to be sons to those that believe in him. I hate when people quote that verse and they say sons and daughters. That's not what it says. That's not even what the original language says. It says, I give you the power, not that I make you a son, I give you the power to be as a son to you lovely ladies. You know why that's important? The Bible says in uh, 1 Peter 3, husbands, love your wives, because when they're not pleased to dwell with you, you're going to hinder your prayer life. And if you can't pray to God, then you're no help to anybody, right? Because the Bible says you need to remember that they are co-heirs to the grace of God. They are co-heirs to the inheritance of the Lord. Why? Because he's given them the power to be sons, just like he's giving you the power to be sons. So the Bible says in Galatians 3 and 28 that in Christ there's no longer male or female. There's no longer Greek or Jew. There's no longer barbarian. There's no longer somebody who's civilized. Why? Because we're all one in Christ. So when he looks at you, he sees Jesus, right? It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter how tall you are. It doesn't matter what your gender is. It doesn't matter what your background is. No, because if he looks at you and he sees his son Jesus, you better believe that he has a blessing in store for you. You better believe that he has breakthrough in store for you. You need to believe that he has promise in store for you. Because you're his son. God's not like your daddy. He's your father in heaven. He's not a sky daddy. Your father in heaven, the Bible says that all the silver and gold belongs to him. It says he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Right? God, the Bible says that the earth is actually the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So no wonder the Bible says in Psalm 23 and 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not. Want. That's interesting. Because you know, a want comes after a need. But David said, I shall not want. You know what we can imply from that? What we can take it from that? David was so blessed that God said, I already gave you what you need. I can only just give you what you want now. God wants to bless you so much that he doesn't even leave you wanting anything. Why? Because you shall not lack when you have this knowledge of him. Because the knowledge of God makes you fruitful. It makes you bear fruit. It changes your life. So we're giving you this understanding that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, it took your curse. It took, oh my goodness. He redeemed you from every curse of the law. From every curse. You who were once deemed unlovable. You who were once deemed Pitiful, powerless, useless, unworthy. Somebody say, he's redeemed me unto life and godliness. He's redeemed me unto goodness and mercy. He's redeemed me unto power. He's redeemed me unto love, unconditional, joy, unspeakable, and peace beyond all understanding. That is his word concerning you. The world was to you as this and that and yada, yada, yada. No, everything the world was to you as is less than what God has called you to be. Don't you know that? That's why 
come up with this dumb stuff like, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, but you want to be black first. I'm a Christian, but I want to be Hispanic first. I'm a Christian, but I'm white first. No, that's not what God says. He says, in Christ, there's no longer race. That's what Jew nor Gentile mean. He don't care about your race anymore. He's just honoring your faith. So when you don't identify, when you don't put your faith and identity in this, you are putting yourself less than what God has called you to be. Don't you know that? That's why the world wants to remind you, oh, yeah, you're just black. Oh, you can't do that. You're just a black woman. Oh, no, 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 you can't do that. You know, women can't preach. Let me say be leading praise and worship. Really? In context of all the scripture, how do you explain the judge um, Deborah with all of that, even in the Old Testament? How do you explain how do you explain Philip's three daughters that were prophetess that gave a word to Paul who wrote uh, what, what two thirds of the New Testament? So why is this? God's called you higher, and men said, no, you didn't go down. That's not what the word says, though. The Bible says that when man says that there's a falling down, you shall say that there's a lifting up. There is a higher calling for you in Christ Jesus. And if you want to believe what he says about you, then only identify with that. The world cannot bring you back down to its standards. They want you to be less than. But God says, no, I need you to be more than because there is a task that I need you to do. So I need you to come out from among them. Stop identifying what the world wants to say about you. Stop letting them label you other than what I called you to be. Because anything that God does not say about you is an evil report. So who's the report shall you believe? Somebody said, we shall believe the report of the Lord. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I need a hope for this. And we got to put our faith in this. Numbers 23 and 8 says that. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom God has not defied? So in the book of uh, Numbers, the Latini tells us this yesterday. Israel had gotten so mighty, so powerful, that anybody that looked at them, they got scared. This new nation out of nowhere, just walking around three million deep, just walking around like, what? who are these people? We need to get rid of them. That's how they felt. And so there's this evil king who hires, who hires an evil merchant to come and curse the nation of Israel. You love the story? Hallelujah. Because the curses worked back then, so they work now, you know? And so, it's like, we need to curse them. We need to destroy them. We need to do something about this. But he said, how can I curse who God is not cursed? How can I defy who God is not defied? It doesn't make sense. Why? Because God is the ultimate authority. So how can somebody say more about you? Why would you relate to something that somebody says about you that God doesn't say about you? Does that make sense? Because don't you understand that what God says is the ultimate authority concerning you? So when somebody says, oh, no, 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 you can't do this. Right? The Bible says that no one can come against you shall prosper. And we never quote the last part. And every tongue that rises up against you, it's your job to condemn it. So if somebody tries to speak an evil report over you, it's your job to condemn it. It's your job to remind them that no, that's not what my God said. No, that's not what I'm going to do. No, that's not what I'm going to be. Why? Because God's called me to be more. Hallelujah. You don't got to say, I'm just trying to do my best. No, lean on God. Because God's going to make you do more than your best. Can you say amen? So I'm finding the Lord in all of this. Because there's more that I need to do, but I need to do it with his power. Do we understand that? And he's giving me this power. He's giving me this grace. He's giving me this blessing. And I can't be cursed. Because he's taking my curse. You know, we just preach about Jesus. He came and died for us so that we can receive salvation. Like salvation is for some far off in the future day. No. Salvation now. Do we understand that? Salvation is for now. In the New Testament, the word save actually means to be set free completely. Set free from wrath, set free from sin, sickness, the curse, the lack, all of it. You are free in all three states of your being, in your spirit, in your soul, and in your body. No wonder the Bible says that God in this is not profitable in this life and also in the life to come. But what religion will try to make you do is to put it off into the life to come. No, but you're supposed to be godly now, but you're also supposed to be blessed now. Can you say amen? I'm also supposed to be flourishing now. Can you say amen? I'm also supposed to be in abundance now. Can you say amen? I'm also supposed to be doing the work of the Lord now. And through this work, it's going to bear fruit in the kingdom, and I'm going to have a harvest because I'm going to reap what I sow. 
And if you were planting a seed, you know what you get back from a seed is way more than what you planted. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. And so nobody can curse you because Jesus took that. He actually became a curse and he died on the cross. He actually became sin and he died on the cross. You know, if you were sin and the curse and he died, you know what also you know what also died that day? Sin and the curse. Do you get that? His identity was changed to sin and the curse because when he died, so did the power of sin and the curse. Do you get that? And so when Jesus says, now go forth and sin no more, that's the worst thing comes upon you. If we're going to believe that God empowers what he commands, when he told that lady to no longer sin, what do you think he did? He gave her the grace to no longer sin. When Peter said, Lord, is it you? If it is you, command me to step out onto the water and come to you. And Jesus said, come. What did Peter do? He stepped out of the boat. I mean, we have to clown Peter, but what other disciples stepped out of the boat? Yeah. Why? Because he knew that whatever the Lord commanded, he also empowered. No wonder he said, I'm going to give you grace to no longer sin. Do we get that? The New Testament churches, they're confused. They're like, well, okay, well, if I'm saved by grace and not through my works, then I can do whatever I want to do now, right? No! It says, shall we sin under grace? No, because grace yeah. is the empowerment to no longer choose sin. Sin had you so down that it was your master. You can remember those days where it's like, why am I doing this? Yeah. Because it was a master to you. You cannot refuse the sin. But lo and behold, God made Jesus to set you free from that master. He came to set you free from all that evil wickedness that was controlling you. Now that you can say no, why would you go back to what had you and change the captivity? Don't you understand that Jesus Christ said that I am anointed to preach the gospel to the poor? I'm anointed to heal the broken heart, to preach deliverance to the captives and recover the sights of the blind, to set at liberty those that are bruised. He says today this is fulfilled in your ears. He came to set you free. So why would you choose bondage again? You know when you go back to sin, it brings a curse. Proverbs 26 and 2 says that the curse shall not come causeless. But you know what causes the curse? Sin. So does it make sense that Jesus Christ is going to set us free from sin? He's going to set us free from the curse, and you're supposed to be able to still sin unknowingly? Does that make sense? Am I delivered if I still have to answer to the sin? Am I delivered if I still have to answer to the curse? No, but I've been redeemed. Somebody, let the redeemer of the Lord say so. Are you saying amen? amen? I mean, I know a lot of you are learning. I'm screaming at y'all, but it's probably the first time you've heard this. Some of you. You don't have to live a life of sin. Jesus set you free from it. You don't have to go back to it. It says that he who the Lord says free is free. So if I'm still having to deal with sin, I'm trying to deal with the fact that I can't stop watching porn. Am I free? So did he set me free? Or did I allow him to set me free? Because I have a life understanding. I went back into what happened in captivity. A lot of people get set free, but because they don't continue to have this knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, their life's not changed. I don't believe that's going to be you tonight. Can you say amen? amen. Somebody says it's not going to be me. Because our lives are going to change. Because we're going to believe what God says about us. We're going to find our identity in what God says. In the spirit. Because remember, your identity is not dictated about your appearance. I'm a child of God. I'm not just some black man. I'm a child of God. I'm not just some short guy. I'm a child of God. I'm not just my mama's boy. No. I'm God's son. Somebody say, I'm God's son. God's son. Ladies, say, I'm God's son. Because we are all one in Christ. Yes, you're a daughter of the Lord as well. But you've got to remember that. You've got to actually wear that proudly. I'm a son of God. Remind me that I have an inheritance too. You're not just the only one that can be blessed. You're not just the only one that can preach. Don't try to bring me down to what the world wants to say. That's not what the Bible says about you. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. A little off of my notes. Mm. Let's talk about the blessing. Talk about some good news. Turn with me to Deuteronomy 28. And so this thing about faith, the Bible says faith pleases God, right? We know that. Hebrews 11 and 6. You know faith is for now, right? The Bible says now faith, faith is for present tense. You have to believe now. Hope is for the future. 
Paint this for the president. All right? So I'm telling all of you that hope. Now it's time to have faith. Faith for the president. And so I want to tell you something that you got faith in. Deuteronomy 28. And let me actually turn here because I forgot what we were doing. And it says, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Mm. I love teaching, y'all. I actually do. It says, thank you. It says, and it shall come to pass, if you shall hearken, look at that. Hearken has its own definition, but I will summarize it as this. Listen to obey. So hearken means that you are listening with the intent to obey. So it says that if you will hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord your God to observe and to do all. So I say all. You know all means all, even in the original language? It says if you will hearken to do all his commandments, which I command you this day, that the Lord thy God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. He's saying this to you now. The Bible says that those that put their faith in God are the sons of Children of Abraham. You know the children of Abraham are the Israelites. And so when he said to Israel then, he's also saying to Israel now, let's understand that by faith you are now a part of the nation of Israel. It's all of the spirit. Yeah. And so you, the Bible says in Romans 9, 6 that all of those that are of Israel are not Israel. What he means by that is that you are not a part of God's spiritual kingdom just because you are born into the Israel nation. You don't get into it by genetics. You get into it by faith in Jesus Christ. And so this is what he said to them then. God's word is everlasting. So this is what he has said to you now. All right? Now this is of the old covenant. And we have a better covenant built on better promises. But what God promised them before, he promises us now, today. So let's not hope anymore. Let's have faith. And the first thing that we need to have faith in is if I'm going to do, obey, Everything that God's telling me to do, all of His commandment that's written in this word, all right? Don't let somebody tell you to do something that's not written in this word. But it says when you do what's written, God is going to make you higher than all nations. You're going to be operating higher than that of people that rule literal yeah. nations. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Faith works by obedience. Don't you know that? Because faith without works is dead. So what works do I have to have? Works that comply with the command of my Lord. So my faith works by my obedience to what God's telling me to do. And then, huh, it's like a three-pronged stool, our pastor said. Your faith has to have obedience. Right? And you know, actually, before obedience, your faith actually has to have love. Because faith works by love in Galatians 5 and 6. Don't you know that? So, you know, a lot of people want to be blessed, but they want to be blessed so they can flex on somebody else. Yeah. Mm, God's going to bless me because you're doing this wrong. And I know if He gives it to me, I'm going to do it right. And I'm going to show you how to do it right. No, no, no. That's not the heart you have to have. Yes, love corrects, but love doesn't brag, it doesn't boast. So, a lot of us are believers so, so that we can brag and boast. So God's not honoring our faith. It doesn't matter how much words you have. Because your faith works by love. And don't you know that love is proven by obedience? The Bible says that in John chapter 14, three times. The Bible says in John 14, 21, that those of you that have my commandment and you obey, you are the ones that truly love me. So how can I say that I love God when I'm disobeying him? And it's the work of the devil to confuse people to get them to believe that you can't fully obey God. Yeah. That I have to enter sin. That's so true. It's true, right? Yeah. Yeah. So now we have these people living a life in disobedience. So their love's not working. And because their love's not working, their faith isn't working. And it all started because they never got understanding of what it is I'm supposed to obey. Wow. But let me tell you. God says just obey what I've told you to do. And you cannot help but be prosperous. You cannot help but have success. You cannot help but get greater. Go higher. Be more than you ever thought that you could be. Because this is supernatural principles. Principles are, are I'm not trying to get too technical with it, but it's, a principle is something that you're supposed to follow. And when you follow God's principles, no wonder you get God's promises. Can you say amen? 
And so prophetically speaking, all this is given to us so that we see when we obey certain things, God gives us certain promises. All right? And so when I obey the rule of giving, the promise is God's going to give back unto me. When I obey the rule of literally just being obedient, thank you, brother, God says he's going to make me higher than all the nations. And not only that, verse 2 says, and all these blessings shall come on, somebody say me, all these blessings shall come on, hallelujah, and they shall overtake, say that better, that was right, but say it again, and they shall overtake, hallelujah, and if you shall hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, blessed will you be in the city, are we in the city right now? All right, so God says, I'm going to bless you in the city. Blessed will you be in the field. Blessed shall the fruit of your body be. So come on, mamas. Blessed be the fruit of your body. Yeah. Miss Miranda, come on, say something. <laughs> can, we give, can we thank God for Miss Miranda? That's Joanna's mom right there sitting next to her. Is she lovely? Yeah. Woo! Hallelujah. Thank you for coming tonight. It says, no, bless your kids. It says, you can bless your cattle. You don't have a cat. You know, even that, your pets, you want to bless your pets. Imagine that, yeah. being so blessed that God's going to bless your animals. Yes. Come on now. It says, I'm going to increase your kind and the flocks of your sheep. It says, bless where your basket be and your storehouse. So you're going to be blessed in the marketplace. Your basket, right? That's what you're gathering in. He's going to bless you in Kroger. <laughs> Hallelujah. And it says, he's also going to bless your storehouses. Y'all got a pantry in the house? A pantry, anybody that wants that is, right? That's your storehouse, is it not? He's going to bless that bank account. Amen? It says, verse 6 says, that you will be blessed when you come in, and you will be blessed when you go out. The Lord shall cause your enemies that rise up against you to be smitten before your face. So you will see the all of those that rose up against you. Hallelujah. And they shall come out against you one way. God's going to make them flee in seven different ways. The Lord shall command these blessings to be upon you and your storehouses, and all those that set their hand, and all that you set your hand to do, and he shall bless you in the land which the Lord your God has given you. Verse 9, this is another check mark. The Lord shall establish you on a holy people unto himself. Somebody say, I belong to God. As he has sworn unto you, if you shall keep, somebody say, look, this is what I have to do. This is what I have to do. I have to keep the commandments of the Lord my God and walk in his ways. And all the people of the earth shall see that you are called up. Oh, hallelujah. Isn't I believe to be famous? You know, one of the books of Abraham is that I will make your name great. Now, if you want to use your fame to advance God's kingdom, to bring faith to the Lord Jesus Christ and increase his following, the Lord says this right here. In verse 10, it says, all the people of the earth. That's not like somebody famous, right? If, so, if all the people of the earth can see that you are blessed, that means that he's causing the globe to know who you are. He's causing the globe to know the glory that he's placed on your life. If somebody believes you go on a mission trip, this is a verse you can use right here. I'm going to cause all people on the earth to see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. You know, when you're blessed, people get afraid to be around you. You know, Isaac was so blessed that they deported him. They deported him. They kicked him out. They said, no, you're too great. you got to get out of our land. How are you mightier than us, you one man? How are you mightier than this entire nation? Go from us. They kicked him out because he was so blessed. They were afraid of him. And the Lord shall make you plentiful in goods. No more lack. It says, and the fruit of your body, and in the fruit of your cow, and in the fruit of your ground, and those of you that got that garden at the house, in the land which the Lord swore unto your fathers to give you. The Lord shall open unto you his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain unto your land in his season, and to bless all the works of your hand. And you shall lend unto many nations, and you shall not borrow. I shall lend unto many nations, and I shall not borrow. Do you get that? You shall lend, you'll be the lender, and you shall not borrow. The Lord shall open up his good treasure, and the last verse, the end of that verse says that you shall lend to many nations, and you shall not borrow. A lot of you are asking people to help you with money and finances, but God says for you, your latter day, you're going to be the one people are coming to asking for money. You're going to be the one that's giving. you. And he's taking out of that situation. Identify with this. It says, and the Lord shall make you the head and not the tail, that you shall be above only. Look at that. You don't have to have up days and down days. He says, I'm going to make you above only and never beneath. Hallelujah. It says, if you shall what? Hearken. Listen and obey. The commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, to observe and to do them. What time is it? 
and keep preaching, keep teaching. But one thing I want to tell you about obedience is uh, in Isaiah 1.19, it says that the willing and the obedient will eat the good of the land. You don't just have to be willing, but you also have to be obedient. Because you know when you're willing, but you're disobedient, that makes you a procrastinator. When your mom tells you to take the trash out. I mean, yeah, you're willing to do it, but you never get up and do it. Why? Because you're procrastinating. God doesn't like procrastinators. He doesn't like people where he tells them to get up and do something and they don't do it. He doesn't like people that he reveals something needs to be done and you just sit there like, oh, somebody should do something about that. No, because he's giving you life. And you know what? The Bible says, arise and shine, for your life has come and the glory of God has risen upon you. So if God has revealed to you his glory, it's time for you to get up. It's time for you to stand. I was hoping somebody was going to start jumping up and down and get the revelation. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, you can. But this, this is what revelation is for. It's not for you to just stay seated. It's for you to get up and to start doing something. And so when you start procrastinating, you don't get to eat the good of the land. Because you're not obeying the full principle of God to receive that promise. And then look, when well, you're not willing, but you are obedient. <laughs> ten times out of ten, you start complaining. And you know it's complaining that God got so upset with the nation of Israel in the wilderness. He's like, do you not understand? I'm the same God that parted the Red Sea. You walked through it on dry ground. I'm the same God that became a pillar cloud for you in the day so that you're not scorched by the heat in the desert. And the same God that became a pillar of fire by night so you're not frozen by the chilling weather in the desert. I'm that same God that made a way out of nowhere. I'm that same God that lowered the hills. I'm that same God that raised the valleys. Why are you complaining? Don't you know that if I did it before, I'll do it again. Don't you know that if I did it for one, I'll do it for all. Don't you know that if I said it to him, I'm saying it to you too. Don't you know that if you just obey and you're willing, I'm going to fulfill my promises. Because God's not a man that he shall lie. So he hates people that complain. It's wickedness. Because complaining shows that you don't actually have faith. Don't you know that? Complaining shows that you don't understand that God's going to do what he says he's going to do. So that's why you should be willing. Because God's going to fulfill his part. That's why you should be obedient. Because God's going to fulfill his part. And when you obey his principles, it, what follows is the promise. A lot of people aren't actually blessed because they're not obeying God's principles. Even the people that are naturally blessed. Because they're not obeying God's principles, they still have these broken hearts. They're still not whole. They're still succumbing to depression. We see rich person after rich person dying tragically. Why? Because they're living a life out of obedience to God. They're finding their identity in the world and what the world can do for them. They're finding their identity in lust, in the drugs, in the stuff that's keeping them bound. But don't you know that Jesus came to set you free? Don't you understand that? And he, he sets you free. He sets you free entirely, completely, in me. Not only does he set you free, but he blesses you. Not only does he bless you, but he redeems you. Not only does he redeem you, but he gives you eternal life and life more abundantly. So why not be willing and obedient? Why not receive salvation? Why let secret sin keep you from the fullness of the covenant that God has written for us? Why let sin keep you from God fulfilling his part of his covenant? Don't you know God is willing and able? Right? The song did the lie when they said God is able to do what he says he was going to do. God wants to bless you. You wouldn't be here right now if God did not have a plan for you. He's a creator. He doesn't create arbitrarily. You think God created you on this earth for you to just be here? No. There's something that he's caused you to fulfill. There's something he wants you to fulfill that nobody else can do. You are here right now because God created you just to be a problem solver. He created you to be a solution for something that has gone awry in this earth. But he needs you to get into covenant first. He needs you to come unto him. I tell you the truth. What makes our God different from all these other false gods and idols is that we're making his image in his likeness. So we see that when they have multiple arms and all these eyes, no, that's not what our God looks like. We look like him. He made us to look like him. No wonder when nobody else wanted you, God wanted you. Because you're his creation. The Bible says that while we were yet in sin, and sin separates you from the Lord, the Bible says, while we were yet in sin, as far away from God that we could ever possibly be, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, to die for you. Hallelujah. How are you nothing? He sent his son to die for you. The most precious thing this earth has ever had came to die 
have for you. Don't you understand that? Don't you understand that the devil knows how valuable you are? That's why he wants to take you to hell. That's why he wants to get you off of the straight and narrow path so that you are succumb to your sickness. So you succumb to your depression, to your oppression, to his demonic power. Because he knows that if you were to get to come here with God, and you were to get to do what God has purposed you to do on this planet, that you're going to be a solution to many. That you're going to be, lead many to Jesus Christ. You're going to lead, lead so many people to salvation. You're going to advance the kingdom of God. You're going to bring joy to this earth. You're going to be lo free love to this earth. Love that covers a multitude of sins. Love, perfect love that casts out all fear. The devil doesn't want that. He doesn't want you shining your light. He doesn't want you bringing light into his dark places and setting the captives free. He doesn't want you operating in the power of God that steps on his head and keeps him bound to be beneath your feet. But you know how he keeps you there? He keeps you there because he keeps you without understanding. He keeps you without knowledge. He gets you all church hurt and stuff. He gets you to just stray away from the God so that you never come unto him. So that you never fulfill your purpose and your calling. That's what the devil wants. Once you know God sent his son Jesus Christ so that you can come unto him. God showed his love for you by sending his son Jesus Christ to die for you on the cross. Naked, bloody, alone. Nobody can do what Jesus did for you. But he did all that so that he can have you, so that you can be his. When nobody else wanted to listen to you, he said, here I am listening. When nobody else wanted to talk to you, he said, hey, I'm speaking to you. When nobody else wanted to look at you, he said, I see you. I have a plan for you. I have a purpose for you. Come to me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn to be fine in me. He's one that parties that you will find rest for your soul, for his yoke is easy and his burden is light. It's easy. Don't you know when you come up to God, it gets easier. Why? Because you don't want to have to do it in your own strength. You don't want to have to do it in your own power, but He gives you His Holy Spirit. Why is life got to be so hard? Because you're living your life absent of the Spirit of God. You know, the Bible says that the Word of God is so sharp, it's so quick, it's so powerful, right? That it can, it can divide spirit and soul. So look at this. The Bible says the Word is so sharp, it divides spirit and soul. You know what that implies about your spirit and your soul? They're so close together. It takes the sharpness of sharp objects to separate them. Your soul is not supposed to be absent of the spirit of God. When God breathed, it said Adam became a living soul. Well, Timmy pointed this out yesterday about something. If living water exists, then it must be a such thing as dead water. So if God breathed and Adam became a living soul, there must be a such thing as a dead soul. The Bible says that the soul that surely the, the soul that sin shall surely die. God told Adam, if you disobey, if you eat this fruit, that'll be the day you surely die. And we know when Adam ate that fruit, he didn't die physically, but he died in the spirit. And the spirit is where things take place first in the unseen. So when he died in the spirit, that's what caused him to have to die in the natural. He became a dead soul the moment he sinned. And this God that came to give you life and life more abundantly, he doesn't want you to be a dead soul. He wants you to be a living soul. He wants you to come unto his son, Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, so that you can then come unto him. So you can approach him with boldness. So you can come to his throne of grace to receive help and need and mercy in the time of need. Grace in the time of need. Power in the time of need. But sin will keep you from being able to do that. It took one sin to get us where we are today. One sin, don't you know that? All they did was eat a fruit. All they did was say, I'm trying to be healthy. No, I'm kidding. But they just ate a fruit. And because they decided to eat a fruit, it's like, look at where we are today because of one decision. Why did that one decision keep you from the abundance of God? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Every eye closed. Now, if you're here today, Your heart was set on fire by these words from the Lord. I'm talking to you kids too. You know that you're not hearkening, listening to obey everything that God's commanded you to do. You know that you don't even know everything that God's commanded you to do. But of the things that you are deciding to do in your entire life, there are some that you decided to do that are go against the word of God. You have some secret sin somewhere, even if it's just one, that you know is bad, you know it's wrong, but you refuse to give it up. I want you to step forward on today and come to this altar. And I'm asking you to come to this altar simply because the altar is a place where things die. 
And so you step forward at this altar. What you are saying is, I have something that I'm bringing here, that I'm taking it here to God. I'm getting rid of this secret sin right now. I'm getting rid of this thing that is keeping me from this abundant life that God has set before me because I want to receive God's promises. And so it starts with me obeying this principle that I need to come to the altar and let these old things die. I need to come to this altar and I need to receive the power to be made new. I need to put on this new man of Jesus Christ. I need to put on godliness. I need to be set free. And so if you need to be set free from sin, I want to give you this opportunity to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't need to be ashamed because this is something that we all have to do at one point. This is something I have to do at one point. I didn't just get to be able to stand before you and speak God's truth to you. No. It started with me giving my life to Him, confessing my sin and repenting, changing my mind. And so if you truly do want to walk out of here, somebody who's blessed, you truly do want to walk out of here, somebody who is now made righteous. You truly want to walk out of here being a child of God who has an inheritance of the kingdom that is above every kingdom. It starts with you giving your life to Christ now. It starts with you receiving salvation now, receiving your freedom now. And you need to be made free from sin. So I want to pray with you. I want to lead you in this prayer. And so as you are finding yourself, right, as you are feeling this, this, this pull to stay seated, but God's drawing you to his altar right now, you're coming to stay before God, not a man. You're coming to give your life to God, not a man. You're coming, you're, you're coming to just be set free. This is going to be something you have to argue with. If you know that you need to be made free, if you know that there's something, that's some power that the devil has over you, come to this altar now. Come now. Come down. Don't be afraid. Jesus Christ died for you publicly, so why not be ashamed to stand before him publicly? Do not be afraid. He has your hand to here at the altar. He's sitting here to pray for you. He's sitting here to tell all of you that are hoping that now is the time to put your faith in Jesus Christ. Now is the time to be made new. The Bible says that in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that those that are in Christ, they become new people, new creations. The old things are passed away. Behold, you now become new. He gives you the power to say no to that sin that has you bound. He gives you the power to triumph over that sin that has you bound. He gives you the power to triumph over the curse that you can be blessed. Highly favored, so the blessings overtake you. That you're blessed in everything that you do. If y'all could please line up shoulder to shoulder across the altar, so just face this on screen and just line up shoulder to shoulder, please. And so, if you feel the Lord call, I'm just tell me what you come. If you feel His drawing, come. The devil can't stop you. You are the one stopping you. If you want to receive, you're the one that's stopping yourself from receiving. There's no demon that can manifest to keep you from giving your life to Christ. There's no power that's stronger than the power of God. And so when you come to this altar, be fully prepared to receive newness, to receive oldness. In Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, brothers, for coming. I'm not going to prolong this. I'm going to pray. Thank you all for coming to the altar. Closing godliness and life over wickedness and death. And God's going to honor you for that. There's no reason to be ashamed. There's no reason to be afraid. God's just time to receive. God has something for you here. You come down. God has something for you here. Hallelujah. And you you come to this altar because you believe that. And so all I can tell you is just not receive it, all right? Now is the time to receive it. So before I pray for you all individually, I want to impart unto you all the Holy Spirit who gives you the grace and the power to, to live above sin. He gives you the grace and the power to live above the enemy of the devil. He gives you the grace and the power to come out of the darkness and shine with glorious light in our Father. I need you to pray this prayer with me. I want to lead you in this prayer. And so as you hear me, all right, just begin to repeat this. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for sending your Son, Jesus, to die for a sinner like me. I believe you love me, and I want to receive your love. I want to receive wholeness from putting my faith in you. And so I confess my sins, and I repent of my wicked ways. I confess your son Jesus as Lord and Savior of my life. I belong to you now, God. So please bless me. 
as your word has called us. I believe in my heart, but to your righteousness, and that from this day forward, you're going to be conforming me to your image and your likeness, so that I may fulfill all that you have commanded me to do. Now, 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 you can stop, stop repeating me. I just want to lay hands on you. The Bible says that we lay hands on part of grace. It's been part of the power, all right? And so all I'm doing is I'm touching you. And what is this? It's a point of contact, all right? Faith makes us do like, um, what's the word? Faith takes actions, right? And it just, it, it, it yields, like it just takes practical and it yields impractical, all right? So me laying hands on you is a practical thing, right? But it yields something impractical. It yields the power of God. It yields the grace of the Lord. And so this is not the time to fall down. This is the time to receive. Some people decide they're going to fall down. Some people are made to fall down. Some people just have to fall down. But that's not what this is about. Now is the time to receive what God has for you. And so I'm going to lay my hands on you. And now God is saying, I'm going to do what you believe me to do. Hallelujah. And so now I need you to be whole. I need you to be filled. I need you to receive your freedom in Jesus' almighty name. Lord, you see her. Lord, you love her. You send your son Jesus to die for her so that you can love her, Father God. Not that she's given her life to you. Not that she's committed her life to you. Your mother. Not that she's committed her life to you, Father God. Now you need to fulfill your word. The ball is in your court, Heavenly Father, to bless her, to bless her children in Jesus' almighty name. Be filled, be made whole. Be filled, be made whole. Be filled, be made whole. Go give her more joy. Hallelujah. This is my life. Be filled, be made whole. Father, oh, thank you for blessing these mother. Oh. You know, my brother was talking to me the other day. He feel me there. He said something special about 2024. 2024 is going to be the year of men. The year of men. And what he meant by that is 2024, the day where it's all the men in the church and you can't find a man anywhere, is coming to an end. And so the Lord just put this on my heart, hallelujah, because I'm, he, I'm, he wants me to tell you that he has a husband, but not just a husband, not just a man, but a man of God. Somebody that's going to lead you and your household to follow all the commandments of the Lord our God, so that he will lead you all into blessing. He's going to lead you all into favor and honor. And so you will know by his actions if he's a man of God or not. So don't let, allow yourself to be confused. Don't let, allow yourself to be tricked. Don't start in the spirit and end in the flesh, all right? They want to, I mean, there's men, they're tall, they're handsome. You know, they're, they're big, they're buff. Don't be tricked by them. All right? Because what God has for you is better than anything the world can give to you. So if he finds his identity in Christ, don't let his appearance fool you. All right? Hallelujah. The ladies may be seated. Thank you so much. Can we rejoice for our new sisters and brothers in Christ? This isn't the time. 
time for you to just blurt out and speak in your tongues, but you can. But I'm just telling you, the Bible says if I lay hands on you, you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. And you will receive it with the heaviness of speaking in tongues. So all I'm going to do is tap you. God's going to do all the work. God's going to do all the work. Hallelujah. He's not only going to give you the Holy Spirit, he's going to give you the grace that comes with the Holy Spirit. He's going to give you the power to do what he's called you to do. He's going to give you the power to fulfill what he made you to do. You're not going to be a pork in a soup bowl. You're going to be a spoon in a bowl of soup. Doing what he made you to do, right? Fulfilling your calling and purpose. So literally, be filled with the Holy Spirit in Jesus Almighty name. Be filled with the Holy Spirit in Jesus Almighty name. Be filled with the Holy Spirit in Jesus Almighty name. Be filled with the Holy Spirit in Jesus Almighty name. Be filled, be filled, be filled. Hallelujah. And so now what I want you to do is to focus on Him. Focus on receiving. All we did was the practical action of faith that we needed in order to, in order to receive His promise. Be filled with grace in Jesus Almighty name. More grace on Him in Jesus Almighty name. More fire, more mercy, Lord God. Give Him more hope in Jesus Almighty name. Heavenly Father, make His name great because He's seeking to make Your name great, Father God. Let Him lack for no thing in Jesus Almighty name. That's not already got you. He honors you. He honors you. He sees you and he's honoring you because you're honoring him. Never question God's design for you. Never question God's plan for you. Keep seeking him. Keep your eyes focused on him. You don't have to look to the left or to the right. Because God has given you a plan and he's fulfilling it. He's giving you a grace and you're fulfilling it. He's pleased with what you are doing. That's why he keeps on listening. That's why you keep on increasing. That's why you keep on going higher and higher. But don't forget him. Don't allow anything to separate you from him and the purpose that he has for you. Only you can say no to what God has for you. Don't say no. Just receive. Just receive. We'll come on the hands of you again. You can go sit down when you feel the, the Holy Spirit releasing you. Lord, we feel over Jesus all by His name.
your way out the bribery. There are things that you are desiring, and I want to give them to you, but I can't fulfill the desires of your heart until you delight in serving me.
The person that walked in is not the same person that walked out, and the person that walked out changed everything that's outside. Because God changed what was inside today. The knowledge of God to bring increase. Lord, I pray over every heart and every mind in this place, Lord. I pray that the word that was sown so deep into their hearts, God, and that they would walk in the full knowledge of God today. And that from this day forward, shall stop them from receiving the supernatural divine increase that you have for every single one of them in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I have the, the pleasures of closing this divine moment. And I will say that it's been a pleasure to be with you guys for this crusade. This crusade is not possible without willing and open hearts. So tomorrow's the day that we mobilize the saints. Tomorrow's the day that we say we have we have a purpose.